Hello and welcome to our online program, the Charisma Academy. Charisma stands for Cultural Heritage Academy for Risk Management, and this is exactly what this program is about. And what I'm going to do now is to give you a brief introduction into what is cultural heritage to be followed by an equally brief introduction on the topic why we actually have to protect cultural heritage, why this is important. We start with the question, what is cultural heritage? What exactly are we talking about? We talk about cultural heritage. We also find and hear the word and term cultural property, sometimes used synonymously. And we have a very nice uh, definition from ICOMOS dating to 2002, where it states that cultural heritage is an expression of the ways of living developed by a community and passed on from generation to generation, including customs, practices, places, objects, artistic expressions and values. Cultural heritage is often expressed as either intangible or tangible cultural heritage. And when we are talking about tangible cultural heritage, this is often referred to as cultural property, and that can be movable or immovable. And what was defined uh, by ICOMOS above, these um, customs, practices, artistic expressions and values, they are what we call intangible heritage. And intangible heritage is very much linked to people. It's intrinsic to people. But you have to keep in mind that cultural heritage per se is nothing without the people to whom it matters, without the people who created it. So we always have to think cultural heritage and people together who live with it, who own it, who use it, who value it. But in this program, we are mainly dealing with um, tangible cultural heritage, be it movable or immovable. And to get a better idea of how broad cultural heritage can be and is, we have a look at the UNESCO 1970 Convention on the Prohibition of Illicit Trafficking of Cultural Property. And in this convention, we find the following definition of cultural property categories. We have rare collections and specimens of fauna, flora, minerals and anatomy and objects of paleontological interest. Property relating to history, including the history of science and technology and military and social history to the life of national leaders, thinkers, scientists and artists and to events of national importance. Products of archaeological excavations, including regular and clandestine or of archaeological discoveries. Elements of artistic or historical monuments or archaeological sites which have been dismembered. Antiquities more than 100 years old, such as inscriptions, coins and engraved seals. Objects of ethnological interest. Property of artistic interest, such as pictures, paintings and drawings produced entirely by hand on any support and in any material, excluding industrial designs and manufactured articles decorated by hand. Original works of statuary, art and culture and any material. Original engravings, prints and lithographs. Original artistic assemblages and montages in any material. Rare manuscripts and incunabula. Old books, documents and publications of special interest. Historic, artistic, scientific, literary, etc. Singly or in collections. Postage, revenue and similar stamps singly or in collections. Archives, including sound, photographic and cinematographic archives, articles of furniture more than 100 years old and old musical instruments. On the next slide, on this slide, I've put together a colorful assortment of what can constitute cultural heritage from manuscripts, folk dances, folklore dances to Castle Neuschwanstein in Germany, Dubrovnik Old Town, an ancient Greek vase, a painting or a tulip landscape in the Netherlands. And also interesting when we're talking about cultural heritage and property is that there are conventions out there that actually do protect um, cultural heritage on a international basis. There's the Hague Convention of 1954, which has two protocols, the first from 1954, the second from 1999, the UNESCO Convention from 1970, we've briefly touched upon, and UNESCO World Heritage Convention. 
And on this screen now, we see the state parties as of 2023 who have ratified the relevant conventions. The UNESCO 1970 convention, for example, was ratified by 143 state parties and the UNESCO World Heritage Convention by 195. Following up on UNESCO World Heritage, UNESCO World Heritage is kind of the highest label cultural heritage and natural heritage can achieve. There, the categories of cultural heritage, of natural heritage, and of mixed heritage. There are 1,199 properties worldwide as of September 2023. 46, 48 of them are transboundary. And out of the 195 state parties, 168 state parties have properties listed as cultural or uh, natural heritage, UNESCO World Heritage Scheme. Each UNESCO World Heritage needs to have an outstanding universal value, abbreviated as OUV. And OUVs can have 10 criteria and at least one of them needs to be fulfilled. On this slide, we see the spread of UNESCO World Heritage around the world, and we see that there are red dots in between, and those are cultural heritage, natural heritage listed as UNESCO World Heritage that is under threat, is on a red list, um, and in threat of damage, either imminent or already being damaged. Following up on that, we can ask us the question, Okay, so these are legal instruments, these listings, these labels, but what exactly does cultural heritage look like? We've briefly looked into the 1970 UNESCO uh, convention, but there is more to that. Let's start with pictures, photographs. We have the pyramids of Egypt. For a Central European as myself, um, if I see this picture, I've grown up with stories about ancient Egypt, the pyramids of Egypt, they are cultural heritage and they are worth protecting. And we add this picture, another picture showing stones, also in Africa. But this picture, for me at first glance, it's not sure if this is something that needs to be protected or if this is some stone heaps, uh, rubble along the roadside. And actually, that's a cemetery in Somalia. A cemetery that's very important to those people who live with it, who own it, who bury their dead people there. And when we talk about heritage and its protection, we have to take that heritage in mind as well that is not protected by any lists or any national or international laws. But the heritage that people live with on a daily basis, that people own and use on a daily basis. And that's actually heritage that might be much more important on that level than something that's labeled UNESCO World Heritage. And that brings us to the question of which criteria make cultural heritage important. And there are a lot of criteria out there if you start thinking about it. I've brought four boxes. There's a very important one dealing with memory, identity, history, pride, and dignity. Another one pertains to economy and tourism. Then there's the blue one, different perception. Who owns which cultural heritage? Who promotes which cultural heritage? We're very much into politics here, manipulation. And then there's the yellow box with the monetary value, theft, illicit trafficking, and looting of cultural heritage. Also a very important topic in the 21st century. We've already been talking about which level of cultural heritage matters to whom and what is most important. Here is what I call the protection pyramid. And on the basis of that pyramid, we have buildings, artifacts, monuments that are not listed or mapped, but that are very important to the people who own it and who live with it on a local level, like the cemetery in Somalia on the picture we've seen before. On top of that, in the pyramid, we have um, monuments protected cultural heritage. National law that protects certain monuments. On top of that, we put the Hague Convention 1955, which deals with the protection of cultural property in armed conflict. So during wartime, international humanitarian law. And to cap off the pyramid, we have UNESCO World Heritage as the highest lab label of uh, importance for cultural heritage.
But again, we have to keep in mind that it's not only the very top of the pyramid that is important. It's for the people living with it and owning the heritage. And think about yourself, what is important to you on your daily basis in the village, in the city where you live. What's important for you, for your family history? It's mostly um, artifacts, buildings, monuments that are not listed or mapped. So the very basis of the pyramid. And if you take the, the link that we've put in the commentaries to this lesson, you can at least watch the trailer of the Destruction of Memory movie. And already the trailer gives you a very, very good insight into the importance of cultural heritage um, and its protection and the importance of cultural heritage for memory, for identity and pride and for the people who actually live with it.